Good afternoon, everyone. Um, there's been a little bit of hitch on the side of the Zoom. So I'm going live on uh, YouTube rather than on the Facebook. And I'll share the link with you guys. Let me just share the link and then we'll start the session. Hi, Vintage. Hello. Yeah. Uh, are you able to hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Oh, fantastic. We'll start very soon. I just want to share the uh, YouTube link uh, to the lecture, and uh, we will start very soon. Uh, Preeti, you there? Yes, sir. Right here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, can I ask you to mute your uh, sounds now so that I can start with the lecture. So I'll start off with the lecture and then we will actually have a discussion. So I've shared the link on YouTube, so I will Start off in a minute. So I hope it allowed me to share the screen now. Yes. That's good. Uh, we should be able to do that in a minute. Uh, okay, so you should be able to see my screen. Um, Vekadesh, can you see the screen? Nice and clear, good. So today we're gonna to talk about uh, yes. loss of resistance blocks, uh, the essentials and uh, uh, what we need to know about them. So the outline of the lecture is going to be that I'm going to start with an analytical basis and we'll talk about tab block, which is a commonest block, about rector sheet block, illuminal uh, block and tab plane, and a bit about the rector spinal block as well. So tab and rector sheet blocks, uh, most of you are aware of. Um, classically, uh, tab block was described uh, in the Padis triangle, and then people started doing it ultrasound guided. So they moved a little anteriorly. And um, I would, so that's that's the area they started going. So initially used to be here, just like uh, I think posterior tab block. Uh, rectus sheath block, we know we do more anteriorly. I will talk about it uh, in a little bit more details. Uh, erector spinal block uh, is a relatively new uh, block where uh, we block the nerves uh, just uh, posterior to the transverse process and between the transverse process and the erector spinal muscle. The landmarks are similar to uh, thoracic parotidal block, uh, just three centimeters from the midline. Uh, I will talk about that as well. So that's the landmark for erector spine. You just go three centimeters or so from the uh, spinous process, hit the transverse process and get the block, as simple as that. 
So before we start off with the um, you know noodles or the top block, we need to discuss about noodles and uh, cushion effect. And uh, that's very, very important. And that will bring us to what Venkatesh today was asking about is sometimes feels this double pop kind of thing before he actually gets to the internal oblique, which confuses it. So there are many ways uh, in which we can blunt the needle. And I will actually show you some in a minute. Um, and the other ways is to, you know, take a hypodermic needle, blunt it, you know, the tip becomes like a parrot beak and use that. So what exactly is cushion effect? It's cushion effect is basically, you know, when your head is on a cushion, squashy cushion, what happens is that the, the you know, the layers of the pillowcase, they actually get together, okay, so become nearer, that's what it is. So when you're using a blunt needle, uh, when you try to go through a skin, which is a tough structure, uh, as you're applying force, uh, the skin and the cutaneous tissues, you know, the part gets squashed and the skin is very close to your first layer. So when you actually go through the skin, you might actually go and pierce the first fascia itself. And if you don't identify that, you would be in a wrong plane because your first pop then you'll think will be through the internal oblique fascia. And then you would be going through the internal oblique fascia and depositing local anesthetic below the internal oblique. So the transverse abdominis fascia. So that's going to be a wrong block. Okay. In some places it will work. If you're very posterior, it will still work. Uh, but if you are in the standard uh, position, that it won't. So this is a demonstration. Can you see how the skin is getting indented with a blunt needle? Okay. So that is what you can actually see that there is, it's for, forming a dip in the skin. And it's quite, you can actually see, it, it looks like that's as if that's the umbilicus. It looks that big. Okay. So, that's what is cushion effect is. You're not gone through the skin yet and you probably are approximating it uh, to your deeper structures. When you're using a blunt tip needle, that is hypodermic needle, uh, what you need to do is uh, use the point a bit. Uh, you go very acutely. So almost parallel to the skin, you make a nick uh, with the tip and then you uh, change the direction to 90 degrees. So now you actually have the curve tip almost uh, perpendicular to the tissues. And when you go in, you actually feel the bounce. Okay. So that's how it is done. The other way to do is to actually take a spinal needle, uh, which comes with an introducer. Uh, I would say use say 22G or 23G. Okay. Um, now, uh, some of these one don't actually come with introducer, so you can actually use a bigger needle and see if your needle passes through them. Uh, so there are, uh, you know, bigger size needles through which you can introduce them. And you then go through the skin. I will show you introducer. I had actually, uh, you know, uh, it's one part of our patent, um, which I have done, so I'll show you that. Bit which you can use, okay. So it's easy then to go straight onto the fascia, fill for the bounce and pop, and you're in the right plane. There is another technique uh, called the hold the fat technique, HTF technique. Okay, this is uh, where uh, when is your things comes in, okay. So this is how you actually do it. So you clean it and you actually hold the skin, okay. And the tissue, subcutaneous tissue, you'll see that the fat and everything actually comes along and under your skin. You're not only pinching the skin, everything comes along with it. Okay. Just uh, watch how uh, this is. This is a long video, but I'm going to cut it short. So you see that, see how it is coming. So whole fat comes in. And when you actually do the block, once you go through that skin, so the depth between your thumb and your index finger is the distance you need to actually go through and you let it go. So when you, are the, when you let it go, you're straight onto the first fascia and you're not going to actually have any of those, uh, you know, clicks. You say, oh, I felt a double click, triple click, nothing like that. Okay. So that's, that's again, is uh, an important thing. So um, let me actually get onto uh, the needles and I'm going to show you uh, some few things. Okay.
I'll see if I can actually do that, but, or I'll do it at the end of the uh, uh, session. I think uh, I need to stop sharing before I actually do that. So I'll stop sharing and okay. So the first thing I'm going to show you is um, the uh, okay. are you able to see what I'm doing? Okay, you got the big noodle and you got the small noodle. Okay, you put it into that and you click it. That's how palette baking is done. Or you can actually just keep, you know, you know, take the, uh, uh, you can take a ampule or you can take the plastic bag. You keep scratching the inside of, you know, uh, the covering and you will actually see that it, it gets you know, blunted. Okay. So I'm going to actually show you how I actually do. I actually take a bigger needle, and then you actually can see that I'm inside, and I actually start sort of bending the tip. Okay. And you can actually see now, if you actually see it along the hand, you can actually see it's got sort of pallet beaking. Okay, it has become blunt. So. When you want to go into the skin, I'm going to show you on a model I've got. So when you go in, you actually go almost uh, parallel to the skin. You go through the skin, right? and then you actually make it 90 degrees, and then you go in, and you can now actually see the feel of bounce. Okay, you can actually feel the bounce. Okay, and then you feel, there you go, one pop. Okay, so that's how you do that with the, with the needle. So that's the needle. Then this is the introducer, which I actually had, uh, you know, got it paid in. It says, so it's just a small introducer. So nothing great about it. Uh, and so you go through the skin, okay. Then through this, the introducer, you can place your thing. You can actually see that I'm actually bouncing on the fascia. Okay. And I can actually feel, feel the click. I can, you can actually hear it as well. And then you go bounce, 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 and that click. Okay. So you're going straight through through the you know fascia, straight onto the fascia. So you obliterate that. Then the other thing was like I actually have shown you about the uh, you know pinching the uh, pack. Uh, there are commercially available needles as well. Okay. So you can actually see that this is uh, called FlexiFlex needle, like made by Brown. Okay. So this comes with a little extension as well. And this is a short bevel needle, okay. So this is not, if you actually look at closely, it's not actually as sharp as the normal needle. So again, we actually see it on that. So you can actually see that you can see that it is, it is actually blunt. So, you know, there. So when you actually go through the skin, you already, so you know, I'm not going through that structure yet. And, Already, I'm feeling some of the resistance forming like a cross on the, uh, you know, this uh, model I've got. Okay, so it's very blunt. Look at that. Look at that. Okay, it's pretty blunt. So you need to go. Now it's gone through the skin, and now you can actually feel the bounce, and then you go and feel a pop. Okay, so it's a, it's a very in a short bevel. It's very very. Uh, uh, it's not a blunt. It's just a short bevel, unlike the hypodermic needle. Uh, if you actually see the hypodermic needle on this, you can actually see the, the bevels actually are different. This is very short bevel, this is long bevel and sharp, okay. So these are also available in the market, so flexibix needles that can also be actually used uh, for, for the block. So uh, this is uh, all about uh, the uh, needles. So we move on to the rest of the lecture. I'll share my screen again. Yeah. So coming back to the uh, transverse abdominus plane. So this is a neurovascular uh, plane. And, uh, you know, so this is a basic structure. So you have the skin, uh, you got the subcutaneous tissue that will vary according to the build of the patient. Uh, then we have the external oblique, internal oblique. Each of them have got their fascia. 
and then he has got the transverse abdominis plane uh, lying above the transverse abdominis muscle. And that's where your nerves and uh, the vessels actually lie. Uh, most people think there are no blood vessels there. There are actually, so you have to see the transverse abdominis plane in a patient who's got portal hypertension. Next time you actually get a patient with portal hypertension, just actually have a look with the ultrasound and you will actually find uh, how big the vessels are, right? So that's, that's where the plane is. And so that's how I've just drawn the uh, internal oblique fascia, which wasn't shown in the previous slide. So if you actually uh, do a block and you can see that there is a membranous layer, so that is where you probably were feeling the, that will click the external oblique muscle is actually pretty thin in most places. And then becomes the internal oblique uh, fascia. One second. Yeah. And then internal oblique muscle. So sometimes you actually, um, or, you know, depositing local anesthetic in there. Okay, so you haven't pierced the internal oblique fascia and you deposit local anesthetic. This is more common in people actually doing uh, ultrasound barrier block. Because you get, they look for this something called lenticular effect. You can see that whole thing is converted to like a lens. They deposit local anesthetic under the internal oblique fascia. Say, so oh, we got a beautiful, uh, this lenticular effect and we deposit local anesthetic and we didn't get a block. It was a beautiful block. We did ultrasound in this case. Whereas the people who actually do a proper block using lots of resistance, they would actually not do this, ever do this. Okay. And that's why I always say this, people who have learned to do this blocks properly, they actually get a better effect when they actually use lots of resistance. Than uh, when they start using ultrasound. This is very common. People who have actually moved from loss of resistance to ultrasound, they, they're, I think the analgesia from tap block is better with uh, loss of resistance than their ultrasound. And they say, oh, everybody says ultrasound is the better uh, way of doing it. So the transverse abdominus plane, like I said, lies under the internal oblique fascia. You have to pierce that and deposit local anesthetic under it. it that's only uh, when you actually do it. So that's what you normally do in the double pop technique or loss of resistance technique. And you get a beautiful uh, spread. That's one thing. The other thing is that when you're using a syringe and um, you tend to actually apply a lot of pressure. You know the words described for epidurals, you know, the fountain effect where the local anesthetic just goes like a fountain. So the spread is also more posterior. It's slightly better uh, with the uh, syringe needle. For rectus sheath block, it's different. We know that the uh, nerves actually move through the rectus sheath, uh, posterior rectus sheath, and the nerves lie, uh, you know, above the uh, posterior rectus sheath. So in here, uh, you have to pierce the anterior rectus sheath you feel a bounce over the posterior rectus sheath and then you inject local anesthetic. So you do not pierce the posterior rectus sheath. Otherwise, uh, you're straight into the periperitoneal fat or the abdomen. So transverse abdominis uh, plane has got nerves. Okay, so we got intercostal nerve, subcostal nerve, the first lumbar nerves. And the way the, way the nerves actually traverse uh, this plane is different at different levels. So if you are actually higher up uh, near the zippy at T6 level, now you have to realize that the, the uh, rectus abdominis muscle is not a, in a straight muscle. It actually curves. It's actually wider at the top and then it comes down. So someone who's got a six packs, not like mine, uh, six in one. Uh, so you need to look at somebody who's got six pack. You will see that they are actually, it is like a vase, okay, which is wider at the top narrow at the bottom. So as the, uh, you know, the nerves are traversing at T6 level, they actually like pretty laterally uh, compared to at uh, say T7, T9 level, which they come closer to the midline. I'm not saying at midline, but they are still uh, further away from the midline. And uh, at T9 and T9 to T10, uh, they're still 
you know, near to the, so they're moved near to the midline. But the L1, no, okay, that is the one which is mostly missed in the classical tap block or the way it is done now after the ultrasound. I'm not talking about the injection into the pethys triangle. I'm talking about the uh, people giving the local anesthetic in the mid axillary line. So when they give uh, local and mid axillary line, the L1 actually lies posterior to the mid axillary line. So you miss out. L1 is missed out in almost 33% of the cases or maybe more. So when people say that they have done a tap block for the hernia surgery, uh, they are probably missing it out. So they may get lucky, they may still get it. So they still get a good block because still uh, two thirds of patients may still be able to you know, catch the L1, but in another 33%, it may not actually, the local assay may not spread posteriorly and you miss out on the uh, ingling on a capacity. Right? Uh, this is diagrammatically showing how the uh, nerves are actually are piercing uh, the rectus sheath. You can see that this go further and further away. The pierce is more posterior. So that's the anterior superior leg spine. Uh, let me show it on the pen. Yeah. So that's the anterior superior leg spine. So you can actually see the L1, ilio hypogastric iliomenal nerves. They are actually piercing more posteriorly, posterior to the anterior superior leg spine. Okay. Whereas these are actually more more closer. So. Uh, Remember, remember that, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a um, very nice uh, you know, dissection of uh, the, uh, the nerve. Uh, so at the bottom end, uh, you can actually see the, that is the, your abdominal, so transverse abdominal plane, and he, it is now, it's known as almost as like a plexus. So uh, some people actually have started calling it transverse subdominus plexus. Okay. Then it is, um, you know, piercings, the rectus sheath, you can actually see it's lying. That is a posterior rectus sheath lying over the posterior under the, uh, you know, rectus abdominis muscle. So um, that's the dissection model of the transverse abdominis and the transverse sorry, rectus uh, uh, plane block and the your transverse abdominis plane block. Same thing di diagrammatically. So uh, you need to be over the posterior rectus sheath to do the rectus abdominis block, but you need to be below the transverse abdominis, sorry, internal oblique fascia and above the transverse abdominis muscle uh, to do a proper tap, tap block. Now, this is a tap block uh, uh, I've shared this video before, and this is like a classical, you know, where you are in the mid axillary line, okay, just above the eyelid crest. Okay. And using actually a, a long uh, block needle, 100 million needles, through a, uh, you know, that's a needle through nil technique. So you go through that, you start feeling the bounce, you feel a pop. Okay. This video is actually good because here, uh, I was actually not getting that kind of a pop as I would expect. And you actually will see that I actually angle it. So when you angle it, because the needle is actually going at an angle, you tend to actually feel the pop better. So being almost perpendicular, sometimes if you're not getting the uh, pops very not easily or nicely, what you do is you change the angle of your needle and you will actually feel the pop better. That's it. Okay. So this one, I actually did a ultrasound as well later on to confirm the local anesthetic spread. Uh, I don't know whether I have it, but well, let's see. Uh, so I'm gonna give 20 ml of the uh, local anesthetic here. So if it's a unilateral, we can just use 0.375. So but are you doing bilateral or doing that? That's yeah, so this, this is a confirmation uh, with the ultrasound. I did a confirmation uh, with the ultrasound. And you can actually see it was like, you can see the external oblique, internal oblique, and below it beautifully, below the fascia, you can actually see the fascia of the internal oblique echo bright. And you can actually see the lenticular effect as is described uh, in the uh, text. So this is this is a beautiful block. You could, so you need to actually feel that pop, the second pop, you know, you need to actually feel it well. Sometimes you don't feel it, just change the angle of your needle and, and going. So that's a good block. 
Ilyu Nunal and Ilyu Happy Gas Signal Blocks, like I said, we actually follow uh, this. So this is by Aschenberger Point. Okay, so uh, this was described in 2006, and this was in cadaveric studies, uh, where they almost did it in two, more than 200 odd, I think, uh, pay on the morals of the, and saw this uh, point. So this point, uh, the Aschenberger point is basically, you need to go five centimeter cranial from the anticipalic spine, and then go five centimeter posteriorly. At this point, both the ilinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves are lying in the transverse abdominis plane. So this is iliohypogastric and iliohypogastric nerves in TA plane. The advantage of this block is that you will actually catch the lateral cutaneous nerves as well. So when the incision goes over for the, if the you know, hernia surgery, the patient won't jump. But if you actually do a classical way, you miss out the uh, little cutaneous nerve. And that's why it's important to do a, a skin infiltration uh, when you're doing the classical uh, approach to the liminal, which is very close. So they go two centimeter medial and two centimeter up. Okay, so you are actually more anterior. Now that's the difference I was talking about. The nerves actually are given up much earlier on. They come into that. So you need to be, uh, you know, posterior uh, for iliminal here. So this is their cadaveric model. They, uh, you can see the needle gone in and they injected dye and the asterisk is actually on the nerves. Okay. So those are both nerves they are coming at in the same plane. So uh, uh, fantastic uh, you know, evidence of that at this point, both nerves lie together. And um, this is the block people need to do for the uh, cesarean section, lower segment cesarean section. Okay, if you want good analysis here, you do it. So do it bilaterally. Uh, same thing, go five centimeter cranially, five centimeter posteriorly. Both sides give 20, 20 mLs, 15 mLs, whatever, depending on the size of the patient. 0.25% uh, works equally well. If you've done it under spinal anesthesia, uh, the block will, the you know, spinal is still working and you got enough time for the 0.25 to work. If you want a quicker answer, then you need higher concentration. But if you're actually you know, requiring, uh, you have already got analgesia from your spinal anesthesia, you can use 0.25% and uh, do that. You can use 10, 10 mLs on both sides of 0.5 or 0.375 as well. They will, if you're in right plane, it will still work because you're not looking at blocking multiple nerves. You're looking at blocking L1, L2. Okay, sorry, L1 and, and uh, T2, L1 and L1 and that's all you need to block. So it will work beautifully for that. So this is a video of the things so you can see that I've marked it. So anticipalic spine, almost two finger back, you know, cranially and then and two finger back posteriorly. It lies almost over the eyelid crest in the uh, mid axillary line. So even if you actually don't get it, you'll need to be just above the eyelid crest. And if you're in the mid axillary line, you will actually feel it. Now, this is a nerve stimulation technique I'm actually uh, describing. You can actually see the these nerves supply the external oblique, internal oblique muscles. So you get this motor effect. But same thing is two, two uh, pops. And we, you can see how widely uh, the contraction are actually felt. So that's because it has uh, got both nerves, ilinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves. And that's why you get a very extensive uh, kind of uh, you know, area which is blocked. Uh, by this. Rectus sheath block, uh, again, you need to actually have the landmark. So you can actually see the unblock that's near the Ziffy sternum. I would actually say that to go much wider. So, but this is because the waves is saying this, uh, you need to be slightly further away from the point which I actually marked. Lower down, uh, you can be just around two finger breadth from the midline. Uh, but on the top, at the, near the Ziffy sternum, I would say as to be around three to four finger breadth laterally. Yeah, to the yeah. three finger breaths probably is the right right thing. Okay. Um, I think you're just showing that the uh, blunt tip needle. So how we are actually using blunt tip needle for uh, rectus sheath block. So you go almost uh, parallel to the skin. So this is a blunt tip needle. Go through the skin. Okay. So and the pop through the anti rectus sheath. Anti-rectus sheath is pretty tough. You feel a good pop, okay. And then you uh, keep moving slowly. 
uh, till you actually reach the posterior rectus sheath. Okay, that's the that wow. Okay, that is the anterior rectus sheath. Now they need to go a little bit more, okay. and then you feel the bounce on that. Uh, this needle is probably uh, not the right size. I would have actually used probably a longer needle for it, but you can indent the skin and actually feel that. So you need to you see that. So indenting the skin, and you actually inject the local anesthetic. Yeah, always has spread because, like I said, yeah, even though people say there is uh, no vessels, there are actually vessels in these areas. So inferior epigastric, superior epigastric, and you travel in that plane, so you can't have to block. And you can see there, that's the local anesthetic coming out. Now, if this was an intramuscular injection, okay, into the rectus abdominis, you won't actually see this uh, local anesthetic coming out. So, like you see that when I was describing the lenticular effect, you know, the local anesthetic. Uh, you saw in the block I gave, uh, which was conformal ultrasound, the local anesthetic is still there. So if I'm there, that local anesthetic will come out with pressure, okay. It will drip out. So that's a good sign that you're in the right, right plane. You're not intramuscular, okay. Now coming to the uh, erectus spiny block. So uh, this is interesting block and uh, uh, guess who is there? Who's doing this block? Kala, Kala. Yeah, <laughs> it is Kala, yeah. This is again from those other videos uh, where we showed that that was uh, again from our NBFM uh, workshop in Ludhiana. And this is also from Ludhiana workshop, right? So here the marking are not actually shown, but she had actually marked, uh, you know, the spine and uh, two and a half or three centimeter. We had used a scale uh, to mark that. And all you need to do is that you go, this is very, very, very uh, superficial at this level, the transverse process. So you just hit the transverse process and inject local anesthetic over. Just bring out a little bit. Don't inject into the periosteum. It can be very, very painful. So you need to just come out. Because when you're going in, you will actually touch the periosteum. It will pitch, it will feel pain. Just come out a little bit and inject. And that's all you actually need to do. So erectus spinal block, uh, this was uh, more for the ultrasound where you actually see the muscles. Uh, so if you're looking um, at the uh, top end, so you're looking at T5 to uh, T, sorry, T2 to T5, there are three muscles you actually go through. So here you're not actually feeling any kind of pops or uh, stuff like that. It's um, just, uh, you know, going through, just hit, hit the transverse process. That's what you need to do. Uh, right. So 20 ml of uh, the uh, local anesthetic, 0.25% uh, spreads almost like from whatever level you are, it'll go two to three segments about two to three segments below. The increase of volume doesn't change this spread, okay? So that's been studied. So only 20 ml is enough. 10 ml, there's only one, one segment probably with 10 ml, so one above, one below. Uh, but 20 mls, you get two, two to three segment spread cranially and caudally. So 20 mls is the local anesthetic. So it can be used for chronic shoulder pain, upper thoracic pain syndrome. And breast surgery, you actually need to do at uh, so, sort of two levels. I would actually say do at uh, T2, T3 and T5 level so that you actually cover wider, wider segments for breast surgeries. So at T5, uh, this can be used for rib fractures, open thoracotomies, backs. Uh, it can be used as a rescue for thoracic epidural failures, um, cardiac surgical like externotomies, uh, T5, so it will likely go three segments. So T2 uh, to T6, okay, so a good uh, sort of um, you know, block for the uh, bilateral block for cardiac surgery. Uh, it can be used for chronic pain syndromes like hepatic neuralgia or post thoracotomy pain or metastatic uh, cancer ribs. So anybody can actually do that. Now T6 to T7, uh, there are only two muscles at this level, um, trapezius and just you're just under the trapezius. So it's very, very superficial at this level. Okay, so when you're going with the skin, that's the whole reason why when you're at T6, T7 level, you actually get the transverse process very, very easily. Uh, T7 to T12, again, there are three, three muscles again. Uh, so again, slightly, but nothing great, okay. 
So at T8 level, you can uh, use it for nephrectomies, hysterectomies, lab ventral hernias, because it will spread down. So you get T8, you will actually spread down to you know, T9, T10, and that's the area where you will be doing your ventral hernias, laparotomies. Okay. So it can also be used for rooftop incision because it'll spread T6. So for rooftop incision, like for Whipples, you need from T6 down to around T10. So T8 is the best level for that. And it's uh, not, too, not too many segments, bilateral block, fantastic energy share you can actually get uh, for that. Okay. Um, T11, L2, L, uh, no, lumbar level, you actually uh, normally uh, don't get the anterior ven or ventral roots. You only get a posterior, so it's good for uh, your spine surgery. For spine surgeries, uh, you just need the posterior root. So uh, you need to go at individual level. There isn't much spread across. Yeah. So it's not like in thoracic level where it's spread two segments, three segments. It's better to actually go multiple levels at the lumbar uh, region. It can also be used for facet pain, uh, you know, L2, 20 ml uh, for vertebral surgeries, uh, chronic myofascial pains can also be used. Uh, so that's the end of the lecture and then we'll have a little discussion. Uh, so what we need to know is we need to understand the anatomy of the facial planes very well. You need to know how the nerves travel in this plane. And you can block almost all the abdominal wall nerves, you know, using lots of resistance block from uh, thoracic to abdominal, you can actually use uh, the loss of resistance block. You don't need anything else. For lower limb, there is spinal anesthesia epidural. Uh, for upper limb, there is supraclavicular interscaling blocks. But for the abdominal and thoracic, all you need to know is the rectus spinal blocks and the tab block and rectus sheet block. That's all you need to know. And you actually can give uh, pretty much any kind of analgesia. And the rectus spinal block is such a versatile block. You can go from the uh, you know, cervical level to the lumbar level for, uh, you know, and, and greatest thing about erectus spinal block is that it provides somatic as well as visceral pain. The only thing for lower segment caesarean section, I would still say that tab block, uh, you know, at the uh, illuminal point, the Eichenberger point, uh, probably works uh, much better uh, than erectus spinal blocks, even though it has been described. Now, the advantage of erectus spinal block is going to be it is going to provide the uh, you know the visual pain component as well. So that will be the greatest advantage of uh, doing erectus spinal block for the caesarean section. But you can combine them as well. So that's you can combine uh, the erectus spinal block with the illuminal hypogastric. Well, that's uh, that's it, and I'll stop sharing, and we can actually go on to the, uh, the discussion part. Yeah, Venkata, you had your raise, hand raised. Uh, yes, uh, my doubt was uh, in a unilateral incision like a left thoracotomy or a right thoracotomy, it's appropriate to do a unilateral. For all other uh, midline incisions, we need to do a bilateral erector spinal block. Then, uh, uh, is it 20 ml of LA, the yeah. erector spinae? So, it should yeah. be 20 ml of LA for each side, right? Then each side, 40, yeah. 40, ml, yeah, 40, 40 ml. ml. Yeah, 0.25 is fine for 40 ml in most patients. But if you have a, have a small patient, okay, you know, very small, but, you know, somebody who is just like five feet <laughs> or patient very thin, well, in those patients, even probably 10, 15 mLs does actually uh, give uh, pretty uh, wider spread. So you have to look at, but that's when we talk about the uh, 20 mLs, you're looking at average build patients. And uh, a yes. single point injection is more than sufficient to cover all the uh, no, no. Or it should be do a multiple. Uh, no, you points. need to you need to look at the incision. So, like I've said, if you're actually going to go for for, for example sternotomy, right? So you better directly just go for two points. Or you're doing for laparotomy incision, just go for two points. And in that case, then you divide. So it's not like you if you're doing say two point injections on each side, then ten and ten mm -hmm. mLs. It doesn't mean that you're going to give twenty and twenty mLs, forty and forty mLs, so eighty mLs. But in some patients who are actually big, so now you get somebody who is almost six feet, three, four, very well big. Now the toxic limit of uh, the, your local anesthetic increases. So you can actually use 15 mLs, 15 mLs, two points, or 20 mLs, 20 mLs. 
So mm-hmm. use your intelligently. I mean, it's all depends on that. These are volume blocks you need to spread. Okay. Whether it's a thoracic parietal block or it is a rectus spinal block, it has always been seen that multiple injection okay, work better okay, with this spread. But if you have to use a single point injection, then you actually inject 20 MS. You, by injecting larger volume, it doesn't actually give wider spread. So that you have to remember. So when you see choose a single point, you choose a point which is actually in middle of your segment. So you actually have looked, so a mine is T2, T6 to T10, so I'll go at T8 level. Okay, that's why I say I would say for a, a Mercedes-Benz engine, or <laughs> arrow-like people do that, or rooftop people do that. That for them, in those cases, uh, T8 is a is a point of in, uh, injection, so it'll spread two segments about two segments below. Kalam Prithi, do you want to share anything? Sir, I wanted to ask actually. Now, tomorrow yeah. I'm going to have a large ventral hernia. Yeah. I'm unsure about uh, the etiology of the hernia. I assume yeah. a patient is not yet admitted, so I've not been able to see the patient. Yeah. I assume the worst case scenario being post-cancer uh, surgery, where they have that big scar from ZP sternum to almost the uh, pubic symphysis. So here I was wondering whether I should go in for these uh, RSB and tap blocks with multiple uh, pokes, or should I go in for an ESP? What do you think would be better for this particular patient? I'm sure there will so, be multiple comorbidities as well. Exactly, exactly. So uh, can you hear me? You yes. can hear me? Yeah, okay, yeah. So uh, if you actually look at the ventral hernia, it depends on the actually size of the ventral hernia. If it's a huge hernia, so even if you give a rectal sheath block, it's, it may not actually, you may not be able to give the block, right? So it's better to go for it, it's fine a uh, block for it. So if you see that it's, it is actually beyond like T10, so T12, uh, it might, you need to look, what is it proximal point is going to be? You ask surgeon, I mean, if, at what level are you going to go? So are you going almost uh, till, you know, T7, T8? Mm-hmm. So looking at that, so, if I were looking at that, so I would actually probably go at T8, T9, or even, and if it is around like around the umbilicus, uh, maybe at T10 level, so uh, 20 ml on both sides uh, would actually probably give a good good block. So you would still go into so that? I would actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it is a large one, I would actually go for, not for the tab, but I will go for it as fine. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want to if ask. You, yeah. If you're going for a tap, then you need to actually go for a posterior tap. Okay, I, I don't believe in anterior tap at all. Okay, so I actually go at the point uh, where both the, uh, you know, it's like classical point uh, where the pathic triangles is, where your external oblique, internal oblique are meeting. Okay, that's point. That is also known as transversalis fascia block. Some people actually call, call it quadratus lumbar block as well. Okay. So uh, that's that's where you would actually go. Go sort of go in a posterior to the to the mid axillary line if you have to be a top block. But I yeah. tell you, I tell you, some of our friends have been doing this erectus spinal block in awake patients. They are very well tolerated. It's like I am injection. They have the patient sitting up. Like for example, for best surgery, uh, patient is going to sit up because you put the electrode at the back. So they sit up. They go back. Bang bang. <laughs> done. <laughs> You know, it doesn't take very long at all to actually do this this block. So it's it's an easy block. Just sit them up and do them sitting up, two points injection. And it takes around, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes. So by the time they get the patient back, clean, draped, by the time it's working. So you know, the point I was trying to make is if I put in an erector spiny block for this particular patient, I'm taking yes. care of the visceral component as well, not just the parietal. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. That's, That's the biggest the advantage. Take care of the upper uh, layers of the abdomen because there's yeah. going to be a lot of manipulation. The uh, intestinal manipulation will be quite a bit intra-abdominal manipulation, depending on yes, what. Yes, there's, yeah, yeah. So the thing about the visceral Pain is visceral pain is easy to actually manage with simple analgesic. Okay, so using the uh, anti inflammatory dexamethasone, which you anyway you're going to use, or uh, uh, you know, non steroidal, if the pain, there is no contraindication to it, you know, those along with paracetamol can manage that. Visceral pain is a vague, vague pain, 
the most pain patients like you suffer in the post operative period does actually come from the somatic component so it's not that you know we should ignore the visceral pain but the somatic components are equally important and that's where i think erectile spinae uh, block do that because they not only provide a somatic but also the visceral uh, component to it it's also been seen that with the posterior tab blocks there might be some spread again to the parietal so we are doing that anyway with erectile spinae isn't it in erectile spinae the local anesthesia is going to uh, seep through the costal transverse ligament into the in a parallel space so that's what you're doing so people who say the posterior tab are, are good because you know the spread can be there to the uh, you know uh, parietal space well here it is it's already doing that for you. so erectile spinae blocks slightly uh, but yeah sorry one thing yeah. so if so, i have a choice and i have a smaller ventral hernia probably i'll go into yeah. the taps whereas if it's a yeah. thing where you know i need multiple levels and i'm not very sure whether my yeah. taps will reach or not i would prefer an esp for that particular yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. i mean like small ventral hernias uh, you know just paramblic hernia i do paramblic or erectus sheath block that's all works really well so you just go literally and uh, onto the little border of the rectus uh, uh, rectus abdominis and inject local anesthetic there and it, it works pretty well for that so yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, uh, sorry. Yeah. For most patients, uh, they will, they cooperate, sir, from an Indian yeah. perspective, for multiple yeah. areas. But in some finicky patients, blocking, uh, using a rectus spinae block at multiple levels, uh, their cooperation will go down with each prick. No, it will be better. I'll tell you why. It will still be better because they don't see you. They don't see the needle at the back. Okay. Oh. Have you ever actually? Okay, there will be some patients who are hypersensitive. You know, like when you do spinal, you know, they just move and yeah. you know they are very very tense. Those kind of patients you will always get. But most patients, you know, they feel it quite easily. It's like doing IM injection. So it's it they they find some patients will still require some. You know, there always be patients who are super anxious. Yeah, yeah color. Mic off, yeah. Mic is on. Sir, what uh, uh, what is the experience of multiple injection tap in the sense four point uh, four quadrant uh, tap blocks along with rectus sheath? You do not give complete twenty ml in one place. Yeah. Instead, you divide. So, uh, how uh, will that be better? Because I have very good experience with that for especially for ventral hernia. That's what yeah, I had that... published also. Yeah, yeah. That was, so that's not. a issue at all uh, and yeah. you can actually give give multiple uh, level blocks so i actually tend tend to actually so if you're looking at uh, say uh, a midline incision from the zp uh, to the pelvic symphysis i would actually give rectus sheath block on the um, for the top end and actually give the uh, posterior tap uh, for lower end. to so that i can actually cover the whole whole segment now if you look at the ventral hernias which are mostly between t6 to t10 right you just you just need your uh, injection to be just in the subcostal area so if you actually are uh, going to give just tap block i would actually just go subcostal in the mid axillary line uh, inject 20 20 ml so it will work fine so just uh, doing multiple injections if you're going one So when you're doing multiple injection in tap, you're going below the costal and above the iliac crest, isn't it? Yeah. What are your four points? Sir, four uh, mid mid or posterior tap, and then the rectus sheath. That's it. Yeah, that's or not, a subcostal, more of a subcostal bilateral subcostal. Tap. Yeah, yeah. So that's not that's not a four point tap. That's that's more like com- combined uh, the uh, re- tap and rectus hmm. sheath rectus sheath block. But you have to remember that the rectus sheath uh, doesn't uh, go beyond the uh, uh, umbilicus, posterior rectus sheath. So you can actually cover cover the top segments, so T six to T ten. You can actually cover uh, with your uh, rectus uh, sheath block. Okay, below that you can cover by the uh, tap block in the sorry or the iliogonal iliohepatic nerve block 
Yeah, so go just below above the iliac crest in the mid axillary line or five centimeter cranially and posteriorly at that point. That actually spreads quite well. Now that is almost like your classical tap in pathetic triangle. And it has been seen that that provides better analgesia here and better spread. And that has been seen by dye studies, uh, the contrast studies. The spread is actually wider uh, if you actually are injecting local acidic there. So it's not only, I think, blocking your L1 uh, and T12, it's probably blocking much more than uh, what we actually think. But yes, if you actually are going to do two uh, four-point stab, now this was done uh, by uh, Puja uh, from uh, Chennai, uh, Puja Bagdi. Uh, they actually did it and they presented, came and presented it here in UK as well. And that they were actually doing actually four-point uh, tab blocks, the actual tab blocks, uh, but they were actually using, uh, they were not using 0.25, they were using 0.125%. So at each point, they were using larger volume, but lower concentration. So I think they got very good. And patient I used to actually come back for the follow-up uh, saying uh, their abdomen feels different I don't know how it felt, but I don't know what they discovered in Tamil, <laughs> but that's how they used to actually, uh, you know, feel. So that's, uh, oh, sorry guys. Yeah. Kala, I can't hear you. Sorry, oh. Hello? Hello, ha, yeah. sir. If we yeah. do not have a rectus sheath, uh, as in Preeti's case, yeah. So then it's better to go for an erector spiner rather ah, than yeah. giving go because subcostal block will not take care yeah. of your. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, so posterior block you can still do. Like I said, posterior tap you can still do. You can still actually get. Like say you go, uh, just below your um, zippy. Sorry, yeah, go below subcostal in the mid axillary lines and posteriorly, and you will actually get that. The problem with all these blocks is that in some patients, you will actually see the uh, you know, pelvis is pretty high and the you know, you know, ribs are almost touching <laughs> touching the, uh, the alia crest. Uh, so, where you go, yeah. So, you don't know where, what kind of block you're doing. But I think yeah, being posteriorly, it does spread much better, whether you are at the uh, uh, subcostal level, or you are at the um, eyelid crest level. So the spread is, is far, far better. Uh, sir, I have a query. Yeah. Uh, in patients with coagulopathy, we avoid epidural. And uh, are there any adverse uh, reports with erectile spinal block in, on patients who have coagulopathy? Is it safe? Yeah, it is pretty safe. So that is that's one area where there isn't any big blood vessels at all. It's like IM injection. And again, um, it's a compartment where uh, you know there is so even if there is any bleed in there, and uh, it's not going to go and compress the cord or anything. It's not going to cause any any effects. So all you will actually have is probably like a, a hematoma. Uh, which will again won't be able to spread much because it's a tight space. So uh, there is no worries. That's the advantage of erectus spinae block that there isn't any uh, nerves there which you can uh, pierce through. There is no uh, big blood vessels. It's just like an IM, IM injection. Sir, and uh, what about additives along with it? You can, you can use it. You can use additives uh, with, so you can same dexamethasone uh, if you yeah. want to the use. The surgeon's you can use. It's a high volume block with uh, dexa. Yeah. So yeah. will it increase the chances of infection? This is what so that's, that's generally, no, when no. you're giving, especially for hernia and mesh plus, when they're no. putting a mesh, this is one of the worries the surgeons have. Please yeah, do not surgeons have dexa. all kind of stupid worries, so I don't actually trust them because uh, you need to actually have um, I can tell you one thing that uh, the stress of surgery and anesthesia actually cause more uh, immunosuppression than, than actually just a single dose of, uh, you know, dexamethasone. So by actually suppressing the surgical stress by giving a good block. So dexamethasone not only increases your duration of block, it also actually improves the quality of your block as well. 
And by doing that, you are actually, you know, improving, improving, reducing the stress of uh, anesthesia and surgery. And so there's less amount of immunosuppression. It's as simple as that, that patients who are in pain tend to actually heal slowly. Okay. And the reason, reason being that their body is stressed. And the body stress, it produces more of, of corticosteroids. Okay, so more immunosuppressants are actually produced. And uh, then by actually, uh, you know, you giving a single shot of dexamethasone. Thank you, sir. I won't worry. I won't worry about, about yes. that. Yeah, I wouldn't even actually bother to tell them what I have given. I say, you mind your business. Okay, let me do what I actually do better. Yeah. So here again, another thing I would like to uh, stress upon is these blocks that we're, we're talking about. These are all analgesic blocks and not really sole blocks for uh, operative purposes. So yeah. you have to always augment them either with a good TIVA or with uh, your secondary uh, uh, airways or whatever else that we are using or put in an ET2 or something else. These are all just analgesic yeah. blocks. These are not sole blocks for anesthesia. That's right? true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, small hernias which they use that umbrella mesh that can be yeah. easily done under rectus sheet block. Oh yeah, yeah. And, I mean, if you're uh, using yeah. Yeah. Sometimes now the segmental spinal has come in. So sometimes yeah. I have had problem because I uh, the, there was a high epigastric hernia which I misjudged the uh, dermatome and uh, I went lower down. My level of the segmental spinal did not reach the entire dissection area. So I had to supplement and uh, I gave a rectus sheath block bilaterally and it took care of it. So you can use it as a rescue once your main anesthesia, uh, anesthesia fails. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah. I thought it's, you've gone mute. No, 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 no yeah, yeah. Sir. You can. You can. So, so, um, like I said, uh, small hernias are mostly uh, in these somatic planes. Okay, so there is no contents, bowel contents, or anything. But then, in those cases, yes, you can actually uh, just use a higher concentration of local anesthetic. Um, it's a smaller area, and it, it works. It works. Same thing with uh, you know your hernia repairs, uh, inguinal hernia repairs. You can do them under blocks. It's not that you can't do them under blocks. But again, if the patient actually has got uh, bowel contents, you know, sliding hernia or you know, obstetric, you're not going to do that with blocks because that's not the uh, right thing to do. Visceral component actually comes in there. Uh, but it's just going to be a simple hernias. Yes, they, I mean, surgeons have been doing uh, inguinal hernias under just local anesthesia for a long, long time. For the bowel contents, sir, uh, you can add on a paravertebral, lumbar paravertebral for in case of the okay. patient. Yeah. Yeah, or, or erectus spinae does the same. Like yeah, said. If same. people are worried, yeah. yeah, if they're worried about, you know, that, oh, they will puncture the lungs and they, this can happen, that can, nothing happens though. <laughs> Even if you yeah. puncture the lung and you give local anesthetic, you have done an intrapleural, you may not get a, a proper block where you want, but you will get an analgesi of the chest wall <laughs> with intrapleural. That's the only problem with uh, the. Okay. Any any other uh, suggestions? Any questions? Any uh, comments? So with the advent of these blocks, now the thoracic epidurals and the epidurals usage has gone down considerably. Also, it is our uh, in our practice has massively gone down. There is also like in our uh, setups is like like now uh, the surgeons wanting to put rectus sheath catheters. That's a big thing. But now we are actually realizing the complications they cause to themselves. <laughs> we have had few cases which had to come back for real laparotomy because they snapped the catheter while taking it out. Okay, there are actually worries about infection uh, being introduced into the raw area. So those, those things are going to be there. So I think the next thing is erectus. So we're trying to introduce erectus spinal blocks. We have not started, but uh, we are actually probably trying to do is, uh, you know, do. So say so use the same vector sheet catheter kit. So it comes with two catheters with uh, two e-needle 
uh, with a Y connector. Um, so you just need to put it in the uh, erector spine space. Uh, the thing is that obviously it takes time, it uh, requires skills and uh, people need to be trained uh, to do those blocks. Especially on the sound blocks, not everybody likes them. There are erector spiny catheters. I have not heard of. I, I have put erector spiny catheter for hip fractures. Sorry, uh, for rib fractures. Okay. Yeah. Problem with them is that if the patient is actually moving too much and they attach, then they come out. So, but erector spiny catheters, we've been doing them. Can epidural catheters be used there, sir? Absolutely. Absolutely. Use the same technique. Yeah. Okay. So because now the have... epidural comes with a locket system. Yeah. So that will be helpful then. Yeah, yeah, you can absolutely, you can actually do. Yeah. So the, the needles which actually comes with the uh, rectus sheath catheter kits is epidural needle basically. It's an 18G uh, epidural uh, needle and uh, catheter. So it's the same. So you can use epidural catheters. And uh, good thing is that they're easily available. So uh, you just need two catheters and uh, a, all the problem happens is with them is. You know, uh, if you don't have the white connectors, it doesn't matter. And again, uh, you may not be using it with pumps. So that white connector is needed if you're using it with pumps. All you do is you have two catheters hanging from either side. You have a filter. That's the greatest advantage. Again, so you're not going to introduce infection, even though, like I have said, local anesthetics are bacteriostatic and the fungicidal. So they're already not going to cause any problems. You're not going to introduce uh, any infection in there. And the local anesthetic is now going to go through a filter, bacterial filter and viral filter. It's, a, it's I think, 20 or 40 micron filter, which is there in the epidural kit. So it's a great filter for most things. So it'll, it'll be very good for that. So just use that, yes. And again, it's away from uh, the surgeon's field. You can put it, you know, you can go... Uh, you're visiting, say, you know, the surgery is to happen two hours, three hours later, you can actually go and put the uh, uh, catheter, leave it and come back. You know, it's, it's going to work. You can always uh, top it up later. So you have to actually remember that local anesthetic get, get metabolized, right? So half of your local anesthetic will be of, say, bipivacan will be metabolized in around 180 minutes. So three hours. Now, Three hours later, you can actually give half the dose, maximum dose to top up. Okay, you need four to five half life for it to completely metabolize. Okay, so you're not going to get uh, that many hours for that. Okay. So you can just use half the dose of what has been metabolized after three hours. So after three to four hours, your surgery is going down. Uh, just give half the dose top up through the uh, catheter. That will extend, extend your analysis here further. Okay. Anything else, guys? Or can we end? Yes, I think we have covered almost everything. Okay. All right. <laughs>